fact launched um, Practical Theology Hub, uh, which, as you are more than likely aware, is a uh, online platform um, which features bi-weekly articles by theologians and practitioners from across different religious traditions uh, on all things related to practical theology at last year's conference. Um, though I, I guess there was six months of planning also happening before that. So for some of us, it feels like we've been in existence for much, much longer. Um, one year on, we're running our first event, which you have all very kindly joined today. So um, my name is James Morris, and I'm an assistant professor at Waseda University in Japan. And um, I'm a member of the editorial team for Practical Theology Hub, along with several other people who are here today. And if you'd like to join us um, after today's session, if you'd like to contribute or volunteer to be part of the editorial team or anything else, um, please don't hesitate to get in touch. I will put my uh, with Practical Theology Hub's email in the chat after, um, but it's editor at biapt.org. Um, so I'm chairing today's session, as you've probably already gathered, and I plan to take, after my hopefully brief introduction right now, a fairly hands-off approach. Um, in planning, we've we've envisaged this session as primarily a conversation between the three speakers. Um, but in order to incorporate everyone's questions and comments, I will probably occasionally uh, have to chip in, um, though I do hope that um, um, the speakers will also be keeping an eye on the, the chat, for example, to see um, incoming uh, ideas. So please do post um, your comments, your questions at any time in the chat, and we will try and incorporate them um, to the best of our ability within the conversations that will be happening. So today we have three wonderful speakers uh, representing three different traditions. Um, first, we have uh, Dr. Harry Cedar, who is chaplain at uh, the Dean's Office and Chaplaincy at King's College London and uh, Spiritual Care Department at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital. And I'm sure that regular BIAPT conference attendees are doubtlessly familiar with Dr. Cedar's work. Um, but I will post, because um, we need to plug Practical Theology Hub as much as possible, some of Dr. Cedar's uh, articles from Practical Theology Hub in, in the chat as well, as uh, after we begin. Um, after Dr. Cedar, um, we will have a, a short presentation from Dr. Stephen Horn, who is a, a lay minister in the Diocese of Canterbury and an Ignite mission enabler and pastor. Um, the audience will perhaps be most familiar with his work, um, his, his recent book, Gypsies and Jesus, A Traveler Theology, which was published uh, last year. Um, I will also put a link in the chat to that for people who have not yet got a copy or, or are not familiar with the work. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Patricia Palazzo Tsai, who uh, lectures in Buddhist theology in uh, Brazil and is part of the Buddha Dharma Association, the uh, Scholars at the Periphery, uh, which is a, a group based in the University of St. Andrews, Scotland, and uh, the International Association of Buddhist Women. Um, she is also a member of our editorial team and has published in Practical Theology Hub, and I will stick her articles in the chat as well. So I'm going to flood you in the chat in a minute. So each speaker will be speaking for approximately 10 minutes um, before we move on to uh, mutual conversation, comments, and take questions and things like that. So without further ado, I will pass things over to uh, Dr. Cedar, and you won't hear from me again too much, hopefully. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk mainly about Shabbat. We were told to talk about hospitality from our traditions, and I'm coming out of um, Judaism, so um, I'm going to be talking about it from that tradition. And I thought Shabbat was a good one to start off with. And um, sorry, I'm going to try and do it properly. So um, it's about the welcome and the hospitality. And I would argue that being taught by hospitality by somebody that will never share their table with you is probably not a very good way to go. So um, learn hospitality from good people because the welcome and hospitality aren't theories. They're practices. They're actually how you treat people 
And so you need to um, know a little bit about how to practice. And we've been practicing for millennia because we have lots of strict instructions about how to practice um, hospitality and the welcome to the stranger. I just wrote about um, righteousness, charity, and justice. They're all from the same word in Hebrew, Sadek. So that's how you're meant to treat each other and the stranger. So we've been doing it for a long time. So we should be knowing what we're meant to be doing. And we even have a word, Shnora. I, um, some people spell it with a U. It's a person that is a really inhospitable person. You don't want to go out for dinner with them. When they split the bill, you'll find that they ordered the most expensive things on the menu and had five courses to your one. So don't be a Shnora. It's a terrible thing to be. Um, hospitality is basically about kindness, generosity, and care. It's not a huge idea. Blessings and prayers. We have um, what um, we call prayers for everything. Um, they're actually blessings. They're gifts of blessing the gifts that we're given for being here. We're very grateful for being here and being hosted by the Eternal. And because we're in the image of the Eternal, we're meant to be very good guests as well. Um, and um, be grateful to being um, hosted here. Um, we had one place that we did a lot of hosting for, and it was called the Mishkan. This piece, oops, sorry. Um, this this photo at the top here is the Mishkan. I'm going to shrink my screen so I don't see me. Um, and this was the tabernacle in the desert that the exile, the people that came out of Exodus, um, the Israelites, um, made in the desert. It's an interesting one because. The whole of creation is explained in about, you know, 20 sentences or something. There are 10 sayings, and God said, let there be, and God said, let there be, and God said, let, boom, done, the whole of creation. And in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, the building of the Mishkan goes on for pages and pages and pages. What curtains to do, the interior design, the perfumes that you should have, the whole caboodle. It's a very, very long section about how to build a meeting place for God so that God is everywhere. But this is a specific place to have this conversation. And it's a bit somebody compared it once to a sort of um, spaceship. If you get something wrong in the spaceship, it just doesn't launch. So the Mishkan has pages and pages of how to build this welcoming place that God will rest in and come to. At that place, there is an altar. And on the altar are sacrifice. We make sacrifices. The sin offerings. Oh, I'm really sorry. Here's here's a bit of cow or beef or whatever. Um, different offerings for different things. However, the sacrifices in Hebrew is called korban, and it means to bring closer, not to give up, you know, as its sacrifices are thought of as something you give up. Korban is to bring closer, and a lot of these sacrifices were shared with God, either God did all the eating, or um, with the priests, or even the person that brought it sometimes would take some of it back and eat it as well. So a completely different idea of... Um, of how to make a sacrifice at this holy of holy places, this altar. And the idea is of sharing the table because now we don't have, this is the um, model of Jerusalem um, from about what it would have looked like about 500 BCE before the common era. So before Jesus and before Muhammad, this is the sort of look it had and Solomon built a temple there, the first temple. It got destroyed, and then a second temple was built, and that was destroyed in 70 of the common era by the Romans. So this is a sort of pompous and glorified version of this mishkan, this tabernacle. It's now um, pumped and ready like this. Now we don't have it anymore, and so we've made the table into the place that we do our celebrations and our, al our altar is um, our table, our dining table, basically. Shabbat became a huge thing to celebrate. It's always been a huge thing to celebrate. I mean, since Moses was telling them how to do it, it's definitely a big thing to celebrate. But in um, 
sat in northern um, Israel in the 14th century, a group of people got together. They're called Kabbalists. Kabbalah means to receive. And they invented this extra way of receiving the Shabbat, this welcoming of the Shabbat, this cre of creation into their homes. And they would run out into the fields on the Friday night, it starts, to welcome the bride of Shabbat, the Shekinah, which is the female version of sort of female aspects of God. Um, she came out of Eden with the humans when they were sent into exile, and she turns up at lots of occasions, basically around a dinner table, um, if there's lots of you around there. But in, in weddings and things like that, she, she is said to be there. Um, and the groom is Israel, Jacob. Um, it's the same person, Israel and Jacob. Um, and we, his descendants, go out to meet this bride. And there's a whole load of songs that we do about it. And so everything we do has been put into practice. And one of the songs we sing is called Kha Dodi. Um, and it's got lots and lots of different versions to it. Um, Le Kha Dodi Li Khat Kala Peni Shabbat Ne Kabbala and we sing the whole thing. It's a very, very long song. The first um, chorus is observe and remember because there are two versions of the Ten Commandments. And one of them says observe the Shabbat, as in guard it. And the other one is remember the Shabbat, remember to keep it. And so they're saying these are both um, the same sort of thing that we have to keep this Shabbat to celebrate being created and being guests on this planet because the eternal is the host. And so um, we have this idea of saying thank you and praising it. And at the end of the very last verse, we all get up in the synagogue. We turn away, we're facing east usually. We turn away to the west to welcome the bride in and we call her and bow to this bride of, of Shabbat coming in to um, our, make our, our Shabbat really nice. And then we go home for dinner and everything that we do has ritual symbols and meanings in um, to them. And when we come home from the synagogue, having done all these um, prayers and blessings and stuff, we are meant to come back to a beautiful Shabbat table to welcome guests to this table. We have two candles, sticks at the minimum, um, because they echo the observe and remember. That's why we have two candlesticks. We have two loaves of bread because we got a double portion of manna on Friday when we were in um, the desert. So we collected one om um, omer per day. But on Fridays, we collected two omer so we didn't have to go out and collect on Shabbat. Shabbat's a day of rest. So everything is very, very holy and um, precisely done. But coming home from the synagogue, having observed all these rituals, and coming back to these rituals, apparently we are accompanied by two angels and we welcome them into our home. And if they, if the Shabbat table is all laid out and looking beautiful, the good angel, there's no such thing as a bad angel, actually. Satan means the opposer, doesn't mean something, the wicked one, it's not that childish. Um, the good angel says to the not so good one, um, may it be like this next Shabbat, and the not so good one has to say, Amen. If it's all chaos and disordered, and we haven't followed the sort of rituals like putting out the Mishka, like putting out this table, the not so good one says to the good one, and may it be like this next Shabbat, and the good one has to say, Amen. So we have these visitors bringing, coming back to our beautifully laid out table where we vis we have these earthly visitors and we have these holy visitors and we sing to them um, a song everybody that keeps Shabbat sings this song about welcoming the angels in it goes Shalom Alechem Malachi Ha'elion Melke Elion Mihi Melech Malachi Ha'malakim HaKadosh Baruch Hu so we welcome them in um, we're very pleased to see them we bless them and then we ask them to leave because a good guest has to go at some stage and we all want to get on with our Shabbat dinner and we all know that the angels don't eat anything so we want to get on with it so it's um goodbye 
Tzacha Chem, which comes from the same word as um, Exodus, to go out, exit, thank you, and goodbye. So we're welcoming earthly guests, the big welcome. We're welcoming the other, and the other can also be this holy one. And we're trying to be a good host to these people and a good guest, because we do know that it's an interrelated um, phenomenon, being a guest on this planet and we're being hosted by God and welcoming the others. And so I thought I'd run you through the Shabbat to show you that it's all about this covenantal relationship between divinity and us mere mortals. And if you want to know more about Shabbat, Abraham Joshua Herschel has a lovely short book on it. And that's me done. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll move on very quickly to uh, the next speaker um, so that we can have a lovely conversation about everyone's presentations at the end. But uh, next up, we have uh, Dr. Stephen Horn. Um, so in your own time, um, please feel free to. I'm, uh, I'm just getting my. Uh... I've got a, a brief PowerPoint in the background, um, and again, for similar reasons, so you don't have to look at me. Um, I do have a habit of uh, going off on a tangent, so I wrote down most of what I wanted to say, try and keep myself a little bit disciplined. I've even put a counter up, and I'm also doing the thing that I just said I won't do, which is to go off on a tangent, so there we go. Right. Um, imagine my, uh, I mean, thank you, first of all, for asking me along to uh, to speak today as well and to be able to share and, uh, and have conversation. I'm absolutely honoured. Um, slightly uh, put back when uh, obviously I realised that I was going to be delivering this presentation from a Christian perspective. And it kind of, <laughs> you know, I think that's quite a uh, quite a, an area that I need to cover. Um, so, again, um, just to sort of like really touch on uh what harry said there is that we're you know looking at this um i'm, I'm going to be looking at this more from a personal perspective of faith um and uh you know perhaps it, it will give us some some ideas um so uh we'll go through i've already been told that the uh that's me you can see me already i wasn't sure if you'd be able to and that's the book that's the cheeky plug there's already a link in the uh, chat so we'll move on uh these photos will make sense very shortly hopefully and um, they're photos that i've taken and um, anyway, let's get on with it. So, um, right. Uh, so, as as we uh, as we draw to the end of this year's conference, um, I think it's apt to revisit the name of our gathering: uh, "Take Off Your Shoes: Hospitality and Practical Theology." Well, if we've wrestled, debated, and examined what that means, I couldn't help but notice the glaringly obvious fact that it is, in many ways, a description of the Christian faith. In many ways, a great commission and the invitation that Christ makes open to everyone. So Christ begins by offering an invitation, come in, take your shoes, take off your shoes, knock, and the door will be opened for you. Christ offers hospitality, welcoming us regardless of who we are, who we might be perceived to be, and often in stark contrast to the condition that we approach him in. Truly, I tell you, he says to the criminal hanging beside him, today you will be with me in paradise. And of course, Christ invites us in to know him better. So Christianity is synonymous with hospitality, Christians sometimes less so. Um, and as such, where, whether our approach is ecclesiological, Christological, theological, the premise of invitation remains. And it's merely the question of application that proves to be the sticking point. Sometimes we limit invitations to the familiar or to the pre-approved. As someone with Roman Gypsy heritage, that was quite evident, particularly where theology was concerned. In November 2020, I became the first person of Romani Gypsy heritage in the UK, possibly Europe, uh, to be awarded a PhD in theology and in the process coining the term traveller theology. Now, a, a proud and pioneering achievement, of course, but mixed with that pride was, and joy was the stark reminder that it took until November 2020 from someone from a Gypsy, Roma or traveller background to make their way to the table of theology to be invited into a world that had only ever spoken about them rather than asked them in to speak. Um, with thanks to my publisher, as we've just seen, uh, in June 2022, that invitation manifested into my book, Gypsies in Jesus, Traveller Theology. So how does my faith in the context that I've just mentioned interact with the theme of hospitality and the trunk of invitation? 
And Christianity, like any model of faith, it offers distinct answers that can change depending on which lens is selected. So, for example, a theological lens offers answers that start with the nature of who and what God is, whilst an ecclesiological lens offers answers that start with the structure we employ to facilitate the kingdom of God, in this instance, church. By and large, most approaches either start with God or they at least end up with God. In traveller theology, we start right in the middle of the story, a uh, cut scene, if you were, to the party in full swing, where the first few scenes of the movie have been skipped. Questions of how we got here or where are we going are, of course, asked, but in a fashion more akin of sitting with your spouse on the sofa and reflecting on what got you here and where you both might go together. Love, in that sense, is, among other things, timeless. Memories of love start and the possibility of it ending are somewhat unfathomable thoughts to process. Contrast, contrast that with a key challenge to faith in a secular post-religious world where the question isn't of the relevance of a creator, but the priority of the individual and their seat on the throne of intellectualism. Relationships and hospitality in that sense is dictated and determined by the dominant pack or groups favoured by those who hold keys to power. But the character of Christianity is not found in what or whom it can enhance and elevate, but in whom and how it welcomes. The crucified God meets us where we are and welcomes us in. He meets fishermen by boats. He meets the thirsty beside wells. He meets the marginalised on the margins. And he meets the condemned between crosses. Sometimes welcomes come with conditions. For example, UK-based Gypsies, Romo Travellers, or GRT for short, their illiteracy rates in the UK are of the highest, they're the highest of any distinct ethnic racial community. Unfortunately, this statistic is historic, stretching back as far as records go. And in the present day, this can prevent churches from being fully hospitable towards GRT people, as liturgies being handed out upon entering a church and hymns being sung in Old English do nothing other, to, other than to confirm to the already excluded that this place is not for the likes of them. So where does Christ meet gypsies and travellers when traditional models of church intellectualise relational models of Christian relationship? I'm glad you asked. For many formed outside of typical Western modes of education and religious instruction, divine revelation comes via a closer relationship with the earth, with nature and with people. In theology, we call it natural theology. In ecclesiological historical narratives, we might liken it to paganism. In GRT communities, we simply understand it as living. Some of us travel for work and pleasure. Some of us live in homes that have wheels. Some of us have never settled despite living in bricks and mortar. Regardless, the relationship with the movement of the earth and the transitory nature of the seasons is for many GRT people as much a part of their DNA as any other physical factor and nothing more important than the journey that we make with our family. When Roma people approached the fringes of Europe as an exiled people nearly a thousand years ago, they were chased by those bearing flags of moons and stars and met with suspicion by those adorning crosses. Yet there, in the midst of intellectual, religious, political and national ostracization, they encountered the living God. The invite, as we've seen in the title of this conference, to take off your shoes, it became an example and a model in Gypsy Christianity to a culture of both welcome and of respect. Don't kind of touch on not outstaying your welcome as such. Take off your shoes for where you are standing is holy ground. Take off your shoes. In my faith, hospitality is not subject to the condition that I must add to myself in any way, but it simply asks that I take off something that is not mine. We say that again. In my faith, hospitality is not subject to the condition that I must add to myself, but it asks that I take something off that isn't me. I take off my pride. I take off my judgments. I take off my sin. In some GRT homes in the UK, faith practiced through a taking off shoes is a very real occurrence. It's not always shoes, but there's certainly a degree of separation between things and practices deemed clean and unclean, uh, pure and impure, acceptable, taboo. Uh, we have a word for it that comes from Romani, uh, the branch language for many Gypsy and Roma ethnic groups and tribes. And the word is mochadi. And it's one of those terms that isn't readily defined in English. Uh, it's originally from Sanskrit, and it originally held a more localised meaning when keeping things like drinking water and cleaning water separate could mean life or death. 
However, in the modern era, it's evolved to involve, include cultural practices such as uh, men and women sit, sit, sitting separate from each other at large social gatherings, uh, not wearing clothes previously worn by gorgers, which is a word some GRT people use for people who aren't GRT. And um, sometimes it could be keeping separate. So you can notice on the pictures actually in front of you at the moment. So this is at a, uh, a Pentecostal evangelical gathering um, somewhere in the UK. Um, and you notice a lot of the a lot of the people standing at the back of men, and we've got uh, the ladies sitting at the front here, and they're covering their heads up. And that's uh, these are all intentional acts of, uh, of of separation, but with the idea of having a kind of ritual purity and avoiding taboo practice. Um, and this is a Christian, again, a Christian conference. Um, but through a traveller theology, the application of Mokadi has permeated. Uh, faith to include separate uh, to include and separate blessing from curse or holy from ungodly a welcome into a gypsy home is an invitation that will possibly require you to take your shoes off but it will certainly come with a hot tea and a warm welcome uh, allow yourself to be a little more vulnerable and you might just start to develop a trusting relationship with your hosts and that's where the real hospitality starts in some gypsy communities it's said that if we hug then we are now family. So uh, unfortunately, I can't hug any of you from here. But if I did, you'd probably owe me a Christmas present or two. And, uh, and we, but, but we'd be family for life. So this surely then is an act of Christian worship in, act, in action. God invites us in. He's hospitable. He is welcoming. He is attentive. Our Christian faith demands the same. When we stand on holy ground, we acknowledge the one responsible for our hospitality. When we stand in a gypsy home, a little cultural advice, we accept the cup of tea. As the Christian representative on this fantastic panel, um, there was much I could have said in today in my allotted time and much I probably should have said. Um, but that pressure would have only come from me, like taking up an invite to an important person's home. What should I wear when I go to their house? Should I take a gift? What if I say something wrong? When we approach the unknown, we doubt ourselves. But when we approach God, we are assured of a different response. We are assured of a welcome. Come to me, says God, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that there is our model hospitality of welcome, of genuine invitation. To welcome in all who are weary, all who are heavy laden, and to offer them rest. And that is how my Christian faith interacts with my hospitality. Thank you very much. Um, wonderful. Um, so, uh, final um, slot is then Patricia. Um, so, please uh, start when you'd like and shout if there are any technical issues or whatnot. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for, for receiving me here. Well, my presentation will be uh, entitled Ex exchanging self for others, the ongoing process of hospitality in Mahayana Buddhism. So, I don't know, before we start, let me get through together. I would like to propose a brief exercise. Please consider as an invitation to experience something different, but feel free to not engage in if you're not comfortable with it. Let us Im imagine ourselves with all the conditions we currently have at our disposal, food, drink, a roof over our heads, education, access to health systems, our abilities to benefit others. Even though we have all that, our minds are worried with the problems we have in our daily lives. Papers to write, our jobs, wages, conflicts with family members or colleagues, local and global politics, and so forth. How much of our daily lives is taken for such matters? Now, imagine we are looking to another direction. There is someone else standing. We do not know if she or he has food, water, a roof, or even if she or he finished school. We do not even know where in the world that person is, or if there is any access to a safe space. We do not know if she or he will be alive later today or even tomorrow. This person is a stranger. We don't know her or his intentions. What should we do? 
Do we think of these encounters in our daily life? This experience we had is the initial part of the method of exchanging self and other in Tibetan Dakshin Jewa to the de developed bodhicitta attributed to the 8th century Mahapandita Shantideva. In his Bodhisattva Charavatara, he states, whatever worldly joy there is arises from wishing for others' happiness. Whatever worldly suffering there is arises from wishing for our own happiness. Exchanging self and other is a method to create an opening in order to take off our shoes and look at others in a different light than the one we're used to, to then putting other people's shoes on. Reflecting on our exercise and scanning my memories of daily routine, at least for me, I could identify more times self-cherishing and self-centeredness than concern for the other. By perceiving this, it is possible to begin a gradual and ongoing process of exchanging self for others. Self-centeredness isn't what defines human nature. There are plenty of examples in history on how the clinging to self-cherishing and self-centered objectives led ways to suffering uh, for oneself and others. But more important are the examples of people that put others' needs in front of their own, serving and benefiting beings, such as the Buddha and Jesus, for instance, or even in our recent times, people as Domenico Colapinto, he rescued many survivors in Lampedusa, Denis Mukwegen, a medical doctor responsible for saving thousands of women's lives, Zilda Arns, a Brazilian pediatrician who saved thousands of children uh, of, of uh, removing them out of hunger, and Pallavi Ghosh from India, who saved lives from human trafficking. We can think for Buddhist traditions. These are, are very important examples of a bodhisattva, someone who exchanges self for others. But we have different forms of political and economic systems that changed people's hearts and minds to a point in which self-centeredness and selfishness were considered virtues. We can think of how this neoliberal mindset shaped so far and continues to shape our societies with, with huge gaps between rich and poor, destruction of nature, climate injustice, gender inequality, famine, and easy, easily treatable diseases that could have been avoided in the so-called third world countries. The way the first world countries went against the World Health Organization and treated the COVID-19 vaccines as products for the ones who can afford, rather than considering a human approach, is a perfect example of how the neoliberal mindset works. So, where does hospitality come? After having done this exercise of exchanging self and other, it is possible to see the other as the same as us, not below us or in any other way around. The other suffers as we suffer. It is by changing how we perceive reality in front of us that is possible to understand hospitality, not only theoretically, but also experientially. In Tibetan language, hospitality, nilin shakto, is defined as the practice of hospitality occurs as soon as I acknowledge the guest by taking upon myself to offer provisions of food and drink. The first action we must, we must see here, perceive here is acknowledging, that is seeing the person's sufferings in front of me, even if they are not visible. Then it is assuming the responsibility or taking upon myself to offer that person food and drink, but not limited to that, because it is common in Tibetan culture and in Buddhist culture in general to offer the safety of a roof. This safety is not only in terms of a place to rest and sleep, but also a place of refuge against life-threatening dangers as violence, freezing weather or extreme heat, and so forth. 
the host becomes responsible for, for providing all those things, but it is, doesn't mean superiority over the guest. Actually, the guest is to be held in high esteem since it is because of them that the host can practice generosity and more than that, has the opportunity to exchange self and other in practice. Hospitality is one of the practical aspects of exchanging self and other. Also connected to this method in hospitality is the last exercise we will do, called toning, which means giving happiness and taking suffering. Let's imagine all the people in the situation we imagined before of our stranger. All of these persons' sufferings, all their pain, hunger, sadness, hopelessness, and so forth, become gray, gray rays of light. We will take all these gray rays and collect them in our hearts. When they reach our hearts, all these sufferings explode. And so does our selfishness. Then finally, we imagine that all our happiness become golden rays of light, and we send those rays to all those people, whatever their needs are. The golden rays fill their bodies, and they experience happiness without any suffering. This is putting the shoes, the other one's shoes, on ourselves. So thank you so much for it. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, thank you to all three of our speakers. Um, they're wonderful presentations. We have um, approximately 25 minutes now for conversation, for discussion. And I, I wondered, <clears throat> I've, I've seen the speakers making notes, um, and I, I wondered if we might start with uh, perhaps just discussing what uh, what parts of the other speakers presentations really spoke to uh, us perhaps um so i'll pass over to uh, you three uh, wonderful well i think it'll be um i think it'll be good to i mean it doesn't we don't i guess we don't have to uh, do it in the order of the presentations but that's the order my notes are in so maybe that might be an idea um so it, yeah if it's okay i'd i the thing that I mean, it was very early on in your presentation, uh, Harry, uh, and but it was so poignant, um, and it was that welcome is not a theory, and obviously we're you know we're in a practical theological hub anyway, um, so you know that that should be the case, but um, so often um, certainly we I say you know we I can only speak from my own sort of practice that um, that that is that that's entirely central you, it, you know you can you can say that you're welcoming but if you go for example on a site or something like that um you're you know you're judged by your welcome and that welcome has to be not so much in your words but in your actual practice um and i, I heard i heard a quote by um a, a famous gentleman the other day but he's not exactly a the he's not exactly he's not a theologian at all but he's um he made a very good point the world doesn't need more uh christians it just needs those that believe in god to start behaving like they do um and um and and it's it was just poignant that it was that that point stuck out because you know so often we need our our, uh, our practice to be practical um and I loved the fact that as you went through and started then explaining the process, how um, everything, every, there was a place for everything. You know, the, the structure in there meant that it, it's, um, it's sometimes, I mean, I, I have a habit of making tick box lists at home but because I like to make sure everything's done. But when you do that, um, it, it means that, you know, nothing's missed out. And I love that attention to detail. And it's all about that practical application. You can't hope that that table that you make, um, you know, presentable for the two angels, you can't hope that that's done. It is something that you actually have to do. Um, and it's, I mean, I'd love to unpack that at some point. Uh, I won't I won't go on too much. Um, um, I'll, I'll let Patricia jump in in a second. Um, but I, I love the fact that the idea of that of uh, welcoming perhaps those we're unfamiliar with, those we who are often unseen in our lives, you know, and and um, welcoming people or um, entities even, you know, of that we don't necessarily understand their expectations, and that challenges us to 
um, you know, in all of our walks of faith to be able to create create situations where we 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 make our welcomes adaptable and welcome for everyone. And and I think you know, there's quite a few of us can speak here from we well everyone is marginalized in one shape or another we all experience you know exclusion for many different reasons um and it is hard sometimes to make um it is hard to make that welcome for people you know especially when you don't know who who they are but it just goes to show that actually sometimes it's down to our own application and our own effort and that if you put in as much of it it leaves people not so much concerned with what the actual details are, but how they were left to feel. And I like that dialogue, the question between the two angels that, you know, it wasn't that one was good and one was evil. It's just, there's this opposition and that, you know, that there's, that to me speaks of a fine balance between what the reaction will be. And and actually that would be based on, you know, that, that effort. So it's not so much, you know, like, well, that silver isn't polished. It's like, no, but look at everything that we've done. So I'll leave that there and I'll, I'll pass over to Patricia or any response, obviously, you want to give, Harry. I'll, I'll quickly respond. Um, there's a big thing about doing the work. I think for a lot of people, a lot of their religious faith is quite lazy. And in our tradition, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of study and it's a lot of doing. Um, and there's um, a thing that says, you are not obliged to finish the task, but you are obliged to start it. Is one that is um, at the very start of the ethics of the fathers, um, per care what. And it's a lot of work to, but it's Shabbat and you stop working. So six days you do the work and then you stop and party. <laughs> so yes, I was interested in your separation. Um, do you separate between the holy and the profane, because um, I was talking earlier, and for us, profane isn't something bad. Everything is good because everything is by God. And yeah. so the planet and every material thing and the stones and the rock, everything's got divine sparks in it. Um, but we have a ceremony at the end of Shabbat, which is called Havdalah, which means to separate, um, where we end the Shabbat and go back to work because you have to feed the body. And I was interested in whether you, in the Christian faith you had that holy and profane um, separation or in the gypsy um, as well, the Roma idea of separation, but also that they're all part of the same. Yeah, I um, <clears throat> I think well, without answering for every Christian on, on the planet, no. um, I think there is, um, I, I, I think it comes down to a subjective choice, not to avoid your answer or to sort of sit on the fence. I think it is a, a, a subjective approach, really. Um, I think there's a general consensus of, you know, when things are considered, say, holy or, or profane. Um, and I think that becomes more of an issue when it comes into sacred spaces. So, for example, church grounds, so, you know, we're but people don't necessarily I, th I think it's a conversation that isn't actually necessarily had a lot of the time people know what they like and what they don't like but they don't often face that challenge until they're actually faced with what that thing is that they don't like and if you really want to find out what someone doesn't like you bring something new into a church and uh, I mean that could be anything from you know an, an item or to sitting in Doris's seat and she always sits in that particular pew that you know that might be I've been in churches where that could be considered profane at times um, but I, I this in certainly so from from a GRT perspective um the way I would liken it is, I mean, like I said, there's there's things that are clean and unclean, taboo and you know not taboo. Um, it's more that it, it's it, in when it was originally uh, that original idea would have stemmed from. So to, to I'm look, I'm conscious of time to give you a very very quick history lesson. Obviously, original Roma people originated from uh, from India, and there was uh, essentially there were civil wars, and this caused a, a diaspora of people, large collective people, to move through the Middle East, come through Europe, and eventually end up in the UK. Kind of reminds us of a certain situation over the last ten years. And in that time, because these people were transitory, they you know, and then because they're from India, there was a lot of Hindu uh, uh, Hinduistic customs that were uh, carried along. You know such as the washing of hands, the washing of feet and the separation of different things. And that evolved to become um, uh, a much more intricate process that started being based uh, in many ways sort of on, on morals and ideas of separation, particularly when the Christian sort of influence came in. So we start getting males and females sitting separate at different places. 
Um, the idea of, um, you know, like I said, you know, clean and, and profane, it becomes one of those things where it's not so much that, you know, you're going to be sort of readily condemned if you're um, if you're in a practice of you're doing something in your daily life, which others would consider profane. It might be a particular profession or something like that, or it might be a certain activity that others don't agree with. Um, um, GRT people would consider it more like think of it. I, sometimes we use the phrase like we have a social battery and, you know, we spend too much time with people. That social battery gets drained. We have some time alone, a couple of good books, a few biscuits and that you know, that starts building back up again. Um, we would look at it from a spiritual sense that, you know, time uh, away from God or the clean would, would you know, bring that sort of almost that battery down. It's If, we, if we're going to take it from the gypsy sense and put it into a purely um, Christian sense, we might say that, um, you know, we've drifted away. We're a backslidden Christian or something like that. But so rather than looking at broad terms, we might be looking at this sort of day to day. Um, that's not a quick, but it is a very quick explanation. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, it's just because we've got clean and unclean and what you can eat and what you can't eat and stuff, but they're not yeah. unholy. Um, yeah. Everything's holy. And yeah. in Patricia's talk, I was particularly interested in the idea, um, mainly because of what we've gone through recently with the death of the Queen and our coronation of um, a new king, this idea of service, that leadership is really about service to other people as well. And hospitality is therefore a sort of leadership thing that you're being of service to other people. I really, I, I like that mix of that it is. We know it, but you've made it very explicit for me. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was really wondering, uh, it's, it's something I was thinking that our presentations had a same link of these invisible signs of hospitality and like the the preparing the table preparing the the our home for for this occasion and also preparing the tea like Stephen mentioned when someone enters your house so these invisible signs of hospitality they speak um so loud in in some in a sense that the, I think the, the whole idea we presented here is to get out of the comfort zone. I enjoyed a lot listening from the Shabbat. I, I really, really found it fascinating, the, the idea of this care. I think the, uh, Deborah in, in the chat, she mentioned the commonality of care. So this is really, really something that is divine and humane. And I think... Uh, and I enjoy this idea of not separation of like holy and unholy or profane. And I, I really enjoy this. Thank you, Harry and Stephen, for this. Yeah, that, thank you, Patricia. That was um, I. Uh, I thoroughly. I was. I couldn't keep up with my notes actually. To be fair, going through that. Um, there was one one uh, where well, there was lots of points that stood out really, but there was something that I just wanted to touch on there. Where um, I don't want to misquote you or anything, but it was essentially you essentially saying that the um, the emphasis moves to the happiness of others. So serving ourselves, pursuing our own happiness, results in obviously our, our own suffering. Um, but it's the the emphasis moving to the happiness of others and, and that that sacrificial. Um, element and it was contrasting but well, not contrasting but it was it was playing that alongside uh, what Harry said about um, there was on, on one of your slides I didn't catch the end of it but it was that because we are made in the image of the eternal um, we're to be hospitable or some, something along those lines and it was that ownership so you know quite often we're um, I as, uh, from a Christian perspective I'm I'm sometimes drawn to um, not, not not necessarily from a personal way, but I'm sometimes drawn to um, Luke 11. I think it's verses uh, like five to eight or something. There's an emphasis on prayer and and, and Jesus is uh, teaching us how to how to pray and delivers the uh, delivers the Lord's prayer. But he goes on um, and um, uh, and he says uh, something along the lines of um, he, he uses a, a scenario where there's a friend um, and, and he asks the friend, you know, you know, what if another you know i've got another friend who's turned up and i need these i think it's like three loaves of bread um but he inconveniences the person at late at night and says you know i need i need you to give this and the person he essentially says you know that you can ask 
and and it will be given unto you but you know it doesn't necessarily make it sort of right in this scenario you might you know upset that person but it's that idea of um of sacrifice and it places the onus on on ourselves um going back to um I'm trying to juggle between points here, but back to Harry's point of being made in the image of the eternal. It's recognizing our positions within our faiths, within our positions, that actually we're the key pivotal point that so we so much want to look at our faith or our actual practice as the mode and operation of hospi hospitality. And we often we, you know, we forget that it's kind of like looking at a driver's manual and saying, you know, well, the car does this and the car does that. It's like, yeah, but it doesn't do anything if we're not in it, the driver. Um, that analogy won't work probably in about two or three years time. But at the moment, you know, in this instance, we, we are made in the image of the eternal. And whatever that means to us, it places the onus on us to be um, to provide hospitality. In short, that there is no hospitality, regardless of the faith and regardless of the position, if we're not in there and we're not willing to sacrifice ourselves um we have to pursue the happiness of others and reject our own happiness in order to be able to you know give that uh, uh, to place that um emphasis of hospitality it all requires sacrifice or only here to alleviate alleviate the suffering of others we must suffer ourselves and from a christian perspective obviously our greatest example of that and i emphasize the word example is jesus sacrificing himself on on the cross um, and it means so much more uh, when we look at it from not just from a perspective of that's what we're, you know, uh, we believe as Christians would believe was done for our sins. But when we look at it through the um, the theme of welcome, the theme of hospitality and that's emphasis that we take on the position of, of the divine it doesn't mean we are divine, obviously. Um, looks we, up for a lightning bolt, but uh, yeah, we don't have that same um, idea. Um, we don't elevate suffering. We don't think it's a wonderful thing. Um, I think it, that's a very Christian perspective. It's not a Jewish one. There's not what I said before. There's nothing really in common that much yeah, between no, no. Jew, Judaism and Christianity. We really, it's not. It's not part of the makeup. The idea is everybody is searching for di the divine encounter, mm. and there is a divine encounter between people as well, because we're all in the image of the divine, but we're not. Um, um, it's not suffering that um, elevates this. It's about happiness and um, in, joy. Yeah, I was was going to point out in Buddhism, the idea of removing, it's because the selfish notion we have of happiness, it's like we're, it's a small happiness, but you're looking around and everyone's suffering. So uh, the notion of a shared happiness is way better so instead of having something for myself, I share, and then everyone's happy. happy. And, and this is the idea behind, like, we need to see that our selfish happiness is not happiness, it's suffering. And we do not want people to continue to suffer. So what we do is sharing that happiness. So this is, is something really important in the exchanging self for others, because it it is important to acknowledge the suffering because it, everyone suffers and all sentient beings in Buddhism, even animals and uh, beings that we cannot see or imagine, all of them are suffering and we can do something about it. it it's hard, but we can do something about it and it's better to share the happiness. Yeah, I, I just think we have a very different perspective um, and I think we would say there will always be people who are ill at one moment or poor or whatever. And there's ways to treat people who are ill and poor. And it's and it's all in the Torah how to treat these people. But I don't I don't believe that suffering. We are all suffering. It's not something that we would say. Some. It, it's it's quite interesting actually that because um that i I've, I've come up with the same uh well obviously not the same but similar a line of conflict um when uh, when i was introducing my ideas actually to one of my i won't name him but one of my supervisors during my phd and and he he, he carried on saying so we we you know so you're obviously saying we so we're doing a a, a liberation theology here steve and i, I said 
we are but only to a certain extent so you know in 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 a liberation sense you know we um we share our time with to sort of quote Jürgen um, Jürgen Moltmann we you know we we're with the crucified god we spend our time with with Christ in that sense at, at the cross but that's the point where liberation theology carries on and our suffering you know then ends but within a gypsy perspective is that actually it's at that point we don't want to let go of the crucified cross we don't want to let go of the crucified god we don't want to let go of that moment other people would see that as suffering but we see that at the point that where we're at the closest with god so reflect that into a, a really practical sense the, the most common thing is that people would because to, to squash a kind of like a um a stereotype that people think people a lot of people think gypsies and travelers are all nomadic they're all moving around and they're all the people that turn up on park greens and stuff you know in caravans and things like that but actually it's a tiny tiny percentage we're talking about two to three percent of, of grt people who are actually fully nomadic um but we are moving in in sort of uh, um in in many other ways and so actually we we endure we endure a different kind of life sometimes. And people say, yeah, but you could be living like this and you could, you know, why not go in a settled house or, you know, th this kind of thing. And because they see it as a, you know, a form of uncomfortableness, some kind of suffering that, you know, that, that we're in, but the idea of suffering in that respect becomes very, very uh, um, subjective. And a, a lot of gypsy and traveler people I know would not change their lifestyle for love nor money it was that that's what they do because that's is who they are and so we quite often you know can put this idea of suffering onto other people and it is uh, kind of as i think as you've alluded to it's, it's problematic when you know when when we want to have uh, when we use a language of suffering when actually sometimes suffering isn't the language of choice it helps sometimes to be able to draw in more people to have a shared understanding but what suffering is um can be sacrificed to so some people sacrifice is suffering um and i think all of the perspectives on this you know require us to sacrifice in some respect but i i wouldn't see it as as, as suffering you know in, in that sense either but i i'd um yeah it just, it just got me thinking because we it, from my particular you know application of faith um the idea of suffering is is probably something you know quite different to what what a lot of others might think. Maybe that's because of certain difficulties had to go through in life with practical things. Maybe it's just a a different set of ideas. Yeah, I I I just think there's a very different understanding that we have, um, and I'm from a people who have suffered. <laughs> we can write the book on suffering, um, and discrimination and exile and colonialism and all of that. So. Um, we don't need to be taught it. For us, the liberation is out of Egypt into the promised land. Um, it's a liberation not just from suffering, but to something. And most of it is a liberation to all those laws in the Torah, which um, are restrictive laws about how much you're allowed to um, do things and what you're allowed to do. It's not freedom to get drunk and party and snort cocaine. It's a very, very, you know, it's a freedom to responsibility for this planet and for each other. Um, but suffering is not the thing that we promote as 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 a part of the theology. A very different view, that's all. So it's interesting to hear these ideas. Or interesting for me so because I've probably all heard these before and, and I don't know anything about it. <laughs> I was just about to say another point, but I'm just going to have a quick look in the chat if that's okay. Yes, yeah, a question just came in. Um, Beth uh, Nolson is curious about the place of reciprocity within a hospitable encounter in your individual traditions. Um, is reciprocity an expectation? And if so, what is expected? It's a question that's come through in the chat. And I think, um, well, we probably have time to deal with that one point of discussion and, and then our time's up. Um, but uh, everyone go go for it. Uh, perhaps we could start with uh, Patricia. Um, okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Beth, for your question um, about reciprocity. Well, in... Um, 
in a Buddhist sense, at least what I can, I can say in, in my practice, um, we don't have the expectation of the other to be the same as us. So there, there is no um, expectation in that sense of what's coming towards us, what's coming uh, to be so we can uh, practice hospitality. And about reciprocity, there is a, a very Buddhist training called Lojong, mind training. So there's an idea that I really enjoy that it is you take the person who treated you the worst, who humiliated you, and is very hard to uh, live with when you have to live together or near you. And you put that person in your crown jewel, like being your teacher, your patient's teacher, because that person is really bringing immense benefits to our practice. And in, in that sense, we can help that person as well by being related to her. It gives a different sense of hospitality as our relationships are hospitality, not only the situation of being in home with a person or receiving a person in a space, but our own life becomes hospitality. And this is an example with a person who did the, the worst of things. So I think, I don't know if it answered, but please tell me if, if it did. It's wonderful. Thank you. Could I bring in Harry and Stephen briefly on reciprocity in their own traditions as well? Let's start with Harry. I did write a paper um, in Practical Theology about um, absolute hospitality, which is what Abraham um, does in Mamre, in the Hebrew scriptures and um, reciprocal hospitality, which is what most of us do. We expect something in return. We're in a covenantal relationship and God's hosting us. Um, the eternal is hosting us, but expects some thanks and recognition in return. So Abraham is um, a bit left field for us, but I, I like this idea of um, inviting the person that's the most harmful. We have a tradition um, before uh, the new year, Rosh Hashanah, where you have to go up to people and apologize. You, in Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, you can apologize to God. But before that, you've got to make peace between people. And so you have to go and say sorry to people and they have to forgive you. That's the other thing. It's the reciprocity there as well. And that's what I thought about when you were saying about um, inviting this person to be your teacher you there are if they don't forgive you you have to ask them three times and if they haven't forgiven you after that and it's got to be a sincere apology obviously if they haven't forgiven you after that then then the onus is on them they're the person that's the problem not you and I love that idea that um that it's a, a reciprocal thing you have to forgive people because you expect the the eternal to forgive you so why, why can't I be forgiven? Um, it's, a, it's a nice idea. And I think that slightly touches on what you were saying about inviting the person that is so difficult to get on with. I love that idea. Thank you. And uh, finally, we'll pass to, to Stephen. Uh, we'll go two minutes over time or so. But it's um, yeah, it's, uh, um, I'm, just, I'm just looking back over the question. Um, it, it's. Uh, I think. I think I'd have to go back to my point sort of earlier on, really, about that the emphasis becomes on yourself as the sort of the mode and the operation of of hosp uh, hospitality. Um, it, certainly within sort of within my tradition. So someone, for, in a very practical sense, if someone turned up to my home, um, the only thing uh, that they would have to reciprocate really is just uh, is that they would participate in whatever the welcome is that I was giving them. So if I was offering them something to eat, they would say yes. If I was offering them a drink, they'd say yes, and they they have to drink. Um, 
Um, and it doesn't mean I just I can offer them anything. You know, I, I will ask them what they want to drink, but it's it's just that that welcome participating in in that welcome. But really, from uh, from a Christian perspective, I guess is that um, again the emphasis becomes on us and not so much that other person um, coming in. So it's not that you have to reciprocate them. Um, I I bring us to Matthew five. Uh, uh 39 40 something like that um it says about do, jesus says about do not resist uh, an evil person if uh, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek turn the other cheek um if someone wants to um take your shirt hand over your coat as well uh if someone forces you to go one mile you go with them two miles um and that's that case of if someone comes in and you know they they turn up to your door unexpected um you go above and beyond what you know what they would um, perhaps ex expect um, you you don't expect you don't expect anything in return um, you expect to give them more and that, that you know likewise if I was to turn up to someone's house if I asked for something um, I wouldn't expect that but if someone then you know gives back twice as much again uh, it, it, it's how I feel and not necessarily what's been done then so uh, yeah yeah um, for us the emphasis becomes on the uh, hospitable nature us being that mode of hospitality thank you very much and um so we have to close here um with the the, the closing of the conference is uh, eight minutes away um thank you very much to our, our speakers and i i really in, enjoyed it myself i hope the, the audiences um um having fun um listening to you as, as well I found it very engaging to to um, hear about uh, three different traditions that I'm not uh, involved in um and we would love to hear audience feedback obviously this is our, our first practical theology hub event so please do get in touch and let us know what you liked what you would like to see different in in future events um was this format good for you was this uh interesting um and please uh do um get involved in practical theology hub if you have anything you want to contribute or um or um, if you want to be part of the team in, in any way uh, we are always looking for more people to get involved so thank you very much um harry stephen and patricia mm -hmm.